Hello everyone, welcome to the third part of my analysis of the movie All's Moving Castle, where I compare the events of the movie with the events of the book that gave rise to the story. In the first part, I talked about the various sources of inspiration that led Ayao Miyazaki to create All's Moving Castle, about the author of the book, Diana Wine Jones, and also a little about the production process of the movie itself. And in the last video, I talked about Sophie's hometown, a family situation, and the beginning of her journey after falling victim to a curse cast by the Witch of the Waste, which turned her into an old woman. As night falls, Sophie finds herself without a place to sleep, and when she comes across Owl's magic castle, she decides she has nothing to lose, because it is said that Owl only devours the hearts of beautiful young women, and seeks shelter inside. Without further ado, let's take it from here. In the movie, Sophie has trouble getting into the castle because it starts moving again. This also happens in the book, except that Sophie encounters two additional obstacles. Invisible walls that prevent her from reaching any door other than the small one at the back, and Al's apprentice, Michael, who tries to shut the door in her face. Sophie, however, sees the fireplace inside the room, calling to her as if it were a choir of angels, and nothing can stop her from invading the castle. She then sits down in the chair in front of the fireplace and when Michael tries to throw her out, she tells him she is there to talk to Hal. It's a lie and Sophie doesn't really intend to wait until the wizard shows up, but the pretext earns her a night's shelter. This apprentice of Hal's also exists in the book, but instead of Michael, his name is Markle. And while Michael is already a grown man, described as tall and dark with a pleasant, open face, dressed respectably, the Markle of the movie is still just a child. This character has his own subplot in the book, but Miyazaki decided to eliminate it, possibly for reasons related to the length of the movie. And since this subplot no longer exists, Michael's or Markle's age no longer matters. In the movie, Sophie's entrance into the castle goes unnoticed and Markle only finds her in the next morning, sitting by the fire. But let's return to Sophie's first night in the castle, when she sits and looks around. Everywhere you look, you can see objects that are easy to associate with the practice of witchcraft. Jars and bottles with colored glass, dried herbs, parchments, seats with notes, old-looking books, a mortar, fetters and ink, scissors, among other things. What the movie shows us coincides quite precisely with the description in the book, but the book also highlights the presence of an old brown smiling human skull, covered in dust. The skull isn't the only dirty thing. The floor stones are said to be stained and greasy, and cobwebs hang from the rafters in dusty droplets. The Sophie in the book only notices how dirty the place is the next morning, when the light bats the room. The spiders we see in the movie working on their webs have black and yellow stripes, so it's possible that they represent wasp spiders, or Argiop bruenici. Wasp spiders are common in the south of the UK and are harmless. Their menacing appearance is intended to keep predators away. Another detail that might be interesting to observe is the design of the fireplace. My research into the topic was fruitless, but feel free to speculate in the comments. In the middle of the night, Sophie wakes up to her own snoring. Looking at the flames, she begins to imagine a face, until she realizes that she is really seeing a face. Calcifer, the fire demon, is described in the book as having a blue face, very long and thin, curly green flames for air and purple flames for a mouth. His eyebrows are also green flames. This appearance is very different from that of Calcifer in the movie, who is entirely orange and less humanoid. The only orange flames that Calcifer in the book has are eyeballs, and two purple dots appear in the middle of these flames, like the pupils of the eyes. Calcifer introduces himself as a fire demon, bound to the earth of the castle by contract. Recognizes that Sophie has been cursed by the Witch of the Waste, but warns her that the spell has two layers. The second layer was actually added by Sophie herself, who is also a witch in the book. She did it unconsciously but that makes the spell even harder to break. Because the truth is that Sophie feels more secure in her new skin, more confident and able to speak her mind, 
and dotting behaviors that would uh, embarrass her if she were younger. Jones approaches the subject of aging in a relatively positive way, which, according to Miyazaki, is one of the attractive aspects of the story. Calcifer then suggests to Sophie that they make a deal. We'll break the spell if she manages to undo the contract that binds him. Out of suspicious, Sophie is tempted to accept, but she asks for more details about the contract. What Calcifer says next contains so much foreshadowing that, if the scene was a glass, it would be overflowing. When he complains about how much he is exploited by Hal because of the contract, he mentions that Hal is artless. What he's doing here is giving Sophie a hint. Says that Sophie can tell anyone about the curse, so Calcifer is forbidden by the terms of, con of the contract to reveal anything about it. So Calcifer uses the word artless as a synonym for cruel, but is also trying to say that Hal literally has no heart. When Sophie asks Calcifer, but don't you get anything out of this contract? He replies, I wouldn't have gotten involved if that were the case. But if I had known what it would be like, I wouldn't have accepted. I'm being exploited. Well, Calcifer was a star, and when stars fall, they die when they hit the ground. But Al caught him. So the contract is what allowed Calcifer to stay alive. The answer to Sophie's question is this. What does Calcifer gain from the contract? Life itself. In order to discover the secret behind the contract between Al and Calcifer, Sophie is forced to stay in the castle. Calcifer promises that he will find an excuse for her stay. In the movie, the conversation between Sophie and Calcifer is almost identical. When Sophie from the book wakes up the next morning, she immediately starts exploring the castle. Looking through a window, she sees a port city, and this confuses her greatly. She then enters a luxurious bedroom, abundant in mirrors with a huge bathtub, a shower and a shelf full of bottles, boxes, cubes and hundreds of packages. This bedroom, however, is in an even worse state than the room with the fireplace. Sophie also finds what appears to be a kind of attic, a cupboard storing two dusty velvet capes and a giant pile of logs and scrap metal in a small yard with high brick walls. Finally, she decides to explore the main door. When she opens it, she sees that the castle is still walking through the hills, but the landscape she sees from the window is that of a city by the sea. This is because the interior of the castle it is its only real part, and that is the interior of Al's house, which is located in Port Avon, so the window always looks out onto Port Avon. When Michael comes downstairs and sees that Sophie is still in the castle, he invites her to breakfast. In the movie, Sophie doesn't explore the castle's rooms until a little later. Instead, Miyazaki decides to introduce how the magic door works straight away. The door gives access to four different places, thanks to a colored mechanism attached to the handle. Three of these locations are the moving castle in the hills above market shipping, when the arrow is pointing to the green section of the mechanism, Port Avon, when the arrow is pointing to the blue section, and Kingsbury, the capital of Ingeri, where the king lives when the arrow is pointing to the red section. The fourth color is black. When the arrow is pointing to the black section, the door opens onto a place shrouded in secrecy. In the movie, what lies behind the blackness is open to discussion. On the one end, we see that all manages to cross the darkness to assess the place where the war is taking place, where warplanes are bombing houses and everything is on fire and that he manages to leave the place of conflict and return to the castle through this door as well. But later, when Sophie is plunged into darkness, she is not taken to the middle of the battle, but to the past, to the moment during all Southwood when he catches a shooting star, which is Calcifer, and saves it from death, thus sealing the contract. The destiny that the darkness conceals might therefore be related to all's own will. In the book, the black section of the door leads to a physical and concrete destination, which is Al's homeland, Wales. This magical door fascinates fans of the film, and some have even created theories relating to the symbolism behind the colors. One theory I saw suggested a connection between the colors of the disc and Buddhism. The funny question hypothesized that each quadrant was a representation of one of the four heavenly kings of Shin Teno. The Shinteno are the Buddhist protectors of the four directions, Tamonte, associated with the north, winter, earth and the color black, Joshoten, associated with the south, summer, fire and the color red, Jikokuten, associated with the 
Est Spring Water and the color blue or green, and Ko Moku Ten, associated with the West Fall Metal and the color white. But apart from the fact that the colors associated with each direction don't match the colors in the castle door mechanism, these colors were not adopted by Miyazaki, but by Jones. She was the one who created this system, so it doesn't make sense that she was inspired by Buddhism, as she is a British author. My interpretation is simpler and consists of the following. Blue for Port Avon, because it's a coastal town. Green for market shipping, because the castle rises above the mountains. Red for Kingsbury because it's considered a royal color, and finally black to represent the unknown. But anyway, what's really essential is to understand that each color makes the door open to a different place. In the film we learn this through the actions of Markle, who answers the door each time he hears a knock. The first time it's two guards in uniform, who are knocking on the door of the house of the Grand Wizard Jenkins, one of all's names, the one by which he is known in the town of Port Avon. The Major wants to talk to Jenkins, but he's not at home, so the Major leaves the invitation in Markle's hands and tells him that the war has just begun and that the King wants the help of all the wizards and witches. The second time it's a girl, who is there to get a spell for her mother, a spell to spread on a boat so that the winds will favor it. This girl is also in Port Avon. The third time it's another man in uniform, this time with an invitation for Master Pendragon, who is summoned to the royal palace. Pendragon is the name by which all is known in Kingsbury. Each time Markle meets someone, he puts on a cloak that is guises his age. When Markle asks who she is, Sophie replies that Calcifer let her in, and Calcifer adds that she was wandering in the waste, which the boy finds strange. Nevertheless, he invites her to breakfast. The breakfast scene and Owl's arrival happen in the same fashion in the book and movie. Except that in the book, when trying to bend Calcifer to her will to make him fry the eggs and bacon, Sophie is fierce instead of calm and smiling, and all on seeing her, is perplexed and exclaims, Who on earth are you? instead of acting nonchalantly, as in the movie. It's during this breakfast in the book that Sophie learns about the workings of the castle, and also learns that all does everything he can to evade questions. Meanwhile, in the movie, at some point during the meal, Al asks Sophie what she has in her pocket, and Sophie finds a card, which burns when she tries to pass it to Al, marking the table with a notch. This carving is one of the three symbols related to witchcraft that appear in the movie, and it is, of the three, the easiest to understand. This, this symbol tells our story quite clearly. On one half of a circle, there are drawings representing a shooting star, a heart, and a humanoid figure, nicknamed a star child. Calcifer was a star child before he entered into a contract with Al. In the other half of the circle, a design resembles the flash of a fallen star. You who swallowed a falling star, O oh heartless man, your heart shall be mine. All reads, it's a message from the Witch of the Waste. He erases the mark from the table with magic, but comments that the spell remains, even thought the engraving has disappeared. I'm not sure if he's referring to the curse that Sophie is the victim of, or to another spell, perhaps one of tracking, that Sophie was carrying around with her. It could even be a reference to the curse that the Witch of the Waste placed on all in the book, one that predicts that if certain requirements are met, all will no longer be able to escape her. We will talk about his curse later. In any case, all asks Calcifer to move the castle 100 kilometers, which is clearly an escape attempt motivated by the event. Both the threats contained in the card, the Witch of the Waste sends to all in the movie, and the terms of the curse he places on him in the book, are based on a poem called Go and Catch a Falling Star, an English poet born in 1572. For those interested, here is the poem in full. Go and catch a falling star, get which shall a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are, or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to hear mermaid singing, or to keep off envy stinging, and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. If thou best born to strange sights, things invisible to see, write ten thousand days and nights, till age snow white airs on thee. Thou, when thou returnst, will tell me all strange wonders that befell thee, and swear nowhere lives a woman true and fair. 
If thou finds one, let me know. Such a pilgrimage were sweet. Yet do not, I would not go. Thought at next door we might meet. Thought she were true when you met her. And lest till you write your letter, yet she will be false, ere I come to two or three. The poem, first published in 1633, deals with the theme of the supposedly inevitable female infidelity. In the poem, a speaker tells a listener that he can search the world over, but that finding a woman who is faithful to him is as unlikely as catching a shooting star, hearing the song of the sirens, or finding out who cleaved the devil's hoof in two. I will leave a link in the description so you can read a more detailed analysis of the poem. In any case, it's not hard to see the reason behind John's choice. It turns out that Al and the Witch of the Waste have history. All is known for being a womanizer and a flirt, and for making women fall in love with him only to then leave them. The reason behind his behavior is actually the literal lack of a heart. Well, the Witch of the Waste was one of Al's victims. All at one point got close to her and later abandoned her. To say that this made the Witch of the Waste furious would be an understatement. And so the curse comes into play, which dictates that when all the impossible things in the poem take place, all will, no, all will no longer be able to keep on running. Back to the movie. To release the tension, Sophie starts cleaning furiously. She focuses so deeply on the cleaning process that she ignores the pleas of Calcifer, who complains that he is running out of food and that it will kill him. She then cleans the ashes from the fireplace and continues to ignore Calcifer, probably because she thinks it being melodramatic. All is the one who revives Calcifer from a small blue flame that resembles a beating heart to his previous state, and then leaves again, passing through the door into the black void. All avoids answering Markle when he asks where he is going, just as in the book All avoids answering questions. Before leaving, he calmly asks Sophie not to get too carried away with the cleaning. Calcifer complains that if he dies, All will die too, the second reference to the terms of the contract between him and All. But Sophie is in a full mood, and replies that her job is to clean. When she opens the window, the castle is moving through the mountains and over the valleys. She is so impressed that she runs to praise Calcifer, who is overjoyed. Now is a good time to talk about a theory that I found quite interesting. Remember that this is a theory that only applies to the movie. Well, Al and Sophie interact a lot in the book, and by interact I mean they're always bickering like an old married couple. But in the movie, the interactions between the two main characters are consistently more sparse. This theory, however, states that Sophie and Al's love is so strong at the end of the movie because of all the time Sophie spends with Calcifer, who has Al's art. In other words, the bond that Sophie and Calcifer end up developing has an impact on Al and Sophie's relationship. Markle explains that the place where they are currently in is called Star Lake. This lake is one of the most iconic landscapes in the movie, but its origin is not easy to trace. Some say that the region of Cornwall influenced the scenic designs in Al's moving castle, particularly the coastal area. Cornwall is a ceremonial county in the southwest of England, one of the Celtic nations and the homeland of the Cornish people. The county borders the Atlantic Ocean to the north and west, Devon to the east and the English Canal to the south. This rural location attracts tourists because of the walking trails that follow the beautiful coastline with its flowery cliffs. The abundance of picturesque arbor villages means that Cornwall may also have given rise to the design of Port Avon. And yet it would be negligent not to mention that the possibilities for inspiration are manifold. For example, in the Alps, there is no shortage of beautiful lakes surrounded by flowers and rugged snow-capped mountains, so the Alps may have been an inspiration as well. What makes this hypothesis so attractive is the fact that Miyazaki was responsible for designing scenes in the anime I Did the Girl from the Alps, which shows his familiarity with the mountain chain in question. On page 126 of the book Miyazaki World, the director admits to having come to feel a deep connection with the landscapes of Europe after visiting the continent in question. While Markle and Sophie are on the balcony, Markle notices that, stuck in the crevice of the castle, a stick is moving on its own. Sophie recognizes Turnip Ed and helps him break free with Markle's help. The castle stops at the edge of the lake and lies down, like a bird landing. Sophie and Markle have lunch outside, while Turnip Ed helps dry the clothes. Needless to say, this scene is exclusive to the movie. 
because it has all the hallmarks of a Ghibli scene. A moment when no action is taking place and the characters, as well as the viewer, can rest and reflect. These moments are called Ma, moments of pause. Margot Tan comments that Turnip Ed might be a demon, and Sophie replies that he might be a Shikigami, but he brought me to this wonderful place. Shikigami are spirits summoned to serve and protect an Omnioji, which, put very simply, is someone who can perform prayers and divinations. Shikigami can take many forms, and the more powerful the Omnioji doing this summoning, the more abilities the Shikigami possesses. If you look closely, you might notice that Sophie's face in this scene has fewer wrinkles. In the book, the curse placed on Sophie actually ages her. Sophie has only two appearances, that of an old woman and that of a young redhead. In the movie, this is no longer quite true. The spell makes Sophie's appearance reflect her state of mind, her self-esteem, her self-awareness, so that sometimes she walks stooped and sometimes straight, sometimes her face is wrinkled, sometimes she looks almost like a lady of a certain age rather than an old woman, and that other times she returns completely to her original age, and the white hair is the only element that reminds us that she is cursed. And in this particular scene, because she feels less self-conscious while enjoying the beautiful scenery, Sophie looks a little younger. As you can see, Sophie fits easily into this family of swords, but in the book things don't go so smoothly. Markel, Calcifer and all himself see her as a kind of natural disaster, a hurricane who has come to disrupt their lives with her cleanliness. This even leads to a confrontation with Al when she tries to clean his room, and later when she tries to tidy, to tidy up the junk in the yard. But as the days go by, Sophie settles in. The people who come to buy spells and potions from Jenkins and Friend Dragon get to know her. They call her Mrs. Witch in Port Avon and Madame Sorceress in Kingsbury, and sometimes they bring her gifts, such as paintings, strings of shells and aprons, which she uses to decorate the cubicle under the stairs where she sleeps. She also learns various things about Al, such as the, that the rumors that he devours the hearts of young girls and sucks out their souls are the stat, rumors, which Michael spread around market shipping at the behest of Al, who wanted his name to be feared in these parts, or that he has problems managing the money he receives, which is why Michael and Calcifer keep a secret deposit. As you can see, this is what I meant when I said that the Al in the book and the Al in the movie are quite different. Sophie from the book and Sophie from the movie are not at all alike either. The Sophie in the book is much more nosy, stubborn, a bit hot-headed and prone to trying to hide her feelings behind a wall of irritation. In the movie she is portrayed as more emotional, aware of her own feelings and kind. But despite the differences, in no other scene to do the all of the in the movie and the all in the book resemble each other as much as in the green goo scene. The scene takes place in the movie just after Sophie returns from the sea market in Port Avon with Markel. They leave the castle with, while Al takes a bath. As they walk, Sophie comments that she has never seen the sea, something that is also true in the book. Suddenly, where, where, while they are buying fish, a wicked warship arrives, causing everyone to crowd around to see it. One of the monsters who serves the Witch of the Waste is in the middle of the crowd, but doesn't see them. Sophie and Markle run back to the castle, and Sophie is clearly distressed, but she has barely time to sit down before the bedroom door bursts open and all runs out, screaming in despair. It turns out that during the cleaning, Sophie mixed Alk's potions, and now the wizard's hair is ginger. Al accuses Sophie of having ruined his hair, and sits down with a thud on the three-legged stool, defeated. In the movie, Al's hair then turns black. All laments... I give up, I see no point in living if I can't be beautiful. And he begins to invoke the spirits of darkness. The room dims and huge, misty shapes emerge from the four corners and advance on Sophie and Michael. In the book, these figures are described as having a humanoid shape, and they let out screams of pain and terror and tatter earth throughout the village of Port Avon. In the movie, the spirits have indistinct forms, reminiscent of lizards and creatures from the Cambrian period. In the book, Sophie, Michael and the whole village have to wait in the rain at the arbor, when the screams aren't so deafening. When the screams give way to silence, Sophie and Michael dare to return to the castle, where they find a hall covered in green goo. 
Calcifer struggles not to drown in the sticky substance. What should we do? Is he dead? asks Michael, agitated. But Sophie clarifies that all is just having a tantrum. Together, they manage to get all upstairs. It took Michael an hour to remove all the goo from Al's body, and another hour to convince him to get up from the bench and put on dry clothes. In the film, Sophie and Michael don't leave for the port because of Al's tantrum, and the people of Port Avon don't hear the horrifying sounds. Instead, Sophie is enraged by Al's comment, since he has never considered herself beautiful, and rushes out of the castle. On the shore of the lake, in the rain, she begins to cry. Turnip Ed arrives to cover her with an umbrella. Markle then takes her back inside, because Calcifer is in danger of being wiped out by the hoos. Sophie drags all into the bedroom so that they can wash him clean of all that slime. Sophie's experience tells her that tantrums are rarely about what they seem. So she eats up some milk in a saucepan and offers it to Hal. Drink it, she orders. Now what's all the fuss about? And it's in and it's at this precise moment that the two stories take completely different turns, which will also force me to deal with each of the narratives separately. But I will leave that for the next video. I hope you enjoyed what you heard and are curious to find out more. See you next week. Bye.